Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be going over fundamentals, but to be more specific, I'll be covering legal and ethical issues. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to this channel if you haven't done so already, and press that red notification button so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. Please do not forget, I'm now offering Next Generation and NCLEX uh, prep. Now it's a two hour course where if you follow me for any amount of time, you know, I go over the meat and potatoes. I go over the type of questions you should expect to see, um, how to answer those questions. Even if you don't know what the answers are, how to be able to think critically through those answers. And I'm going to go over uh, lots of questions for you. We'll do lots of practice. So you can book for that review on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Also, I've got plenty of audio lessons available um, depending on what you're looking for. If you're in a nursing program and you need to really, really, really do well on your next exam, be sure to check that out. I've got lots of audio lessons. Again, my website is nexusnursinginstitute.com. Without further ado, guys, let's get started. Legal and ethical issues. The right to make one's own personal decisions, even if it might not be in their own best interest, is known as beneficence, fidelity, autonomy, or justice. If you guys weren't able to make it into the Kahoot on the live, you guys can just put your answers in. Good, most of you guys got it correct. It's autonomy, it's the right to make decisions for yourself, even if it may not be the best decision for yourself. So for an example, for as an example, you have a patient that desperately needs blood. Their um, H and H is just down to the ground. You gotta give them blood immediately. And they're refusing, they're, they're Jehovah's Witness. They don't want any blood. And you explain to them, if you don't get this blood transfusion, you may possibly die. And they say to you, I'd rather die. Well, guess what? They have that right to make that decision for themselves. That's autonomy. Now, ben beneficence, that's doing good for your patient. Fidelity, that's keeping promises. So for example, if you tell your patient, I'll be back in five minutes, make sure you come back in five minutes, even if it's just to tell them it's going to be another 10 minutes, another 10 minutes, but still come back, keep your promises and justice that is treating everyone fairly, treating everyone the same. You encourage your patient to ambulate after surgery. This is an example of which principle is it fidelity? Justice, veracity, or benefice, benefice, oh God, you know I can't speak, beneficence. Very good. It's beneficent. So let's talk about the wrong answers first, and I'm going to get into the right answer. So uh, you know fidelity is keeping your promises. Justice is treating everyone fairly. Veracity is telling the truth, right? Beneficence, that's doing something good for your patient. So for example, this is a perfect example. You're ambulating your patient after surgery. How you encourage your patient to ambulate after surgery. How is that good for the patient? Well, we know after a patient has surgery, doesn't matter what kind of surgery that patient had. If they had surgery, we're always going to be concerned about three things. We're going to be concerned about hemorrhage, that patient bleeding out. We're going to be concerned about that patient developing a clot, that clot moving, turning into an embolism, going to their lungs and getting a PE, right? And the third thing we're going to be concerned about is infection. We don't want that patient to get something like pneumonia. So you want the patient to walk around. Walk around is going to improve circulation so they don't develop a DVT. It's going to help, you know, with them with the breathing. We want to get them moving around. We don't want them to develop an infection such as pneumonia. So that's something good. So you're encouraging that patient to ambulate after surgery is doing good for them. So that's beneficence. Failing to keep your patient safe from harm is an example of what? 
assault, battery, negligence, or malpractice. Yep, most of you guys got it right. It is negligence. So negligence is when you fail to do something that you've been trained to do. You should have done, right? Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Assault. Assault is the threat. You don't even have to touch your patient. Just the threat of harming them or touching them against their will, that threat is assault. Battery is when you follow through with the threat. You know, lots of times people use assault and battery interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. Assault is a threat. Battery is um, is actually following through with that threat. Now, what's malpractice? Just like I told you, negligence is failing to do something that you've been trained to do. Malpractice is doing something that you've been trained not to do. You should have known better, but you did it anyway. That is the difference between negligence and malpractice. Those are not the same things. You miscalculate a drug dosage and cause harm to the patient. This may result in a charge of what? False imprisonment, breach of confidentiality, assault, or malpractice. You guys are doing great on the live. Wonderful, malpractice. You did something that you were trained not to do. Remember when you were taking dosage calc in pharmacology, right? You should have known better. Very good. So false imprisonment. Let's talk about false imprisonment. So you're, you're in the day room and your patient gets rowdy. You need to get that patient away from the other patients. You want to keep your patients safe. What's the best thing to do? Well, you can walk them to an open garden and talk to them, get them to calm down. That doesn't work. You can bring them into a room with the door open, but you're still in a room secluded from everybody else. You can try to talk to them, right? You close that door. You time to bed. Guess what you're doing? That's false imprisonment. You cannot, um, you can't put your patient in... I can't think guys on the live. What's, what's the word I'm looking for when you tie your patient up, you can't put them in what, what's it called again? Everyone's quiet on my live now. Thank you. Restraints. Yes. <laughs> you can't, um, excuse me. The only time if you have to put your patient in restraint, and that means you've tried non-invasive measures and it didn't work and they were going to be a harm to themselves or others. You have to get in order to cover you for that. So you, if you have to put your patient restraints, guess what? You have to get an order to cover you. And that um, the healthcare provider has to see that patient within 24 hours, okay? Otherwise, that's false imprisonment. Uh, breach of confidentiality. Um, example is violating patient's HIPAA, right? Um, giving personal health information to any party that is not caring for that patient that does not need access to that information, that breach of confidentiality. And I, I already explained to you guys what assault was. The threat of touching someone against um, their will. You overhear another nurse tell the patient that if she refuses her PO meds, she'll be forced to give the meds IM. This is an example of what? Assault, battery, negligence, or malpractice. Thank you, Michelle. Good, assault. The threat. So you're trying to give your patient their medication by mouth and they're refusing. When you tell them, if you don't take this medication by mouth, I'll be forced to give you an IM injection. Says who? 
unless this patient has been deemed legally incompetent to make decisions for themselves, they have the right to refuse medications. Remember what that's called? Autonomy, right? So the threat of giving them that medication, that's assault. And if you follow through and give them that IM injection against their will, that's battery. You suspect a coworker to be high on an unknown substance. What should be the nurse's immediate action? Tell the coworker to stop or they'll be reported. Contact the authorities. Report the concerns to the nursing supervisor or report the observations in an incident report. That's right. Report it to the nursing supervisor. So here's the thing. Whenever you have a problem with a coworker, as long as it has nothing to do with patient care, it has nothing to do with patient safety, the rule of thumb, you always go to that coworker first. So if you feel like that coworker always has an attitude, they always have something to say to you, as long as it has nothing to do with patient care or patient safety, you're going to go to them first and try to resolve the issue. If you're unable to resolve the issue after going to them directly, that's when you go over, up the chain of command. However, if patient care, patient safety is involved, you bypass that coworker and you go directly to your nursing supervisor. So absolutely, that is the correct answer. Now let's go over the wrong choices. Tell the coworker to stop or they'll be reported. Uh-uh, patient safety is involved. You don't even say anything to that coworker. You go directly to your nursing supervisor and you, you uh, report this. Contact the authorities. No, you have to go up the chain of command. How are you going to bypass your supervisor and call 911? No, you go to your um, superior. Look at this. Report observations in an incident report. Incident reports are interesting. Let's talk about this. This is very important for you guys to know. The incident report, guys, is for the facility. It does not go into the patient's medical chart. As a matter of fact, as a nurse, you're not even allowed to mention the existence of an incident report being filed. The incident report is strictly for the facility to make sure that um, they can um, implement policies and measures so whatever it is that happened doesn't happen again. So for example, if a patient falls, you have to fill out an incident report, you, you, know, you call the family, you let the family know that they fell, you write that in the incident report, but that incident report does not go in the patient's medical chart, number one. And number two, you're not even allowed to uh, document in their medical chart that an incident report was created, okay? The incident report is, strictly for um, the facility itself. It does not go into the patient's medical chart. Select all that applies. Which activities may be delegated to an unlicensed assistive personnel? And when I say unlicensed assistive personnel, someone such as a CNA or a PCT. What activities can be delegated to them? Select all that applies. Medication administration. Vital signs, taking vital signs for stable patients, suctioning patients, ambulating patients, performing wound care on patients, or performing ADL, such as bathing or dressing patients. Which ones can you delegate to an ass unlicensed assistive personnel? Okay, let's go over the correct answers first. They can take vital signs, absolutely. But look at this, vital signs for stable patients. If your patient is acutely ill, guess what? You, the RN, you got to be the ones going in there to do the vital signs because while you're taking those vitals, you're going to be assessing your patient frequently as well. Okay, so vital signs for stable patients. Ambulating, absolutely. But let's talk about this, ambulating stable patients. Let's say this is a patient who um, just had a stroke. 
They've got left side deficits. And this is the first time that they're being ambulated after the stroke. Guess what? You cannot delegate that to the UAP, even though that's within their scoping practice to ambulate. Because this patient's not yet stable, you, the RN, have to do the first ambulation because while you're walking with that patient, you're going to be looking at them and you're going to be like, you know what? Mm, this patient doesn't look too stable. I'm going to call the healthcare provider and ask for a physical therapy consult, right? By the way, only you, the RN, can call the healthcare provider to ask for consults such as physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Now we know in real life, LPNs do it all the time, but I'm talking about testing purposes. For testing purposes, only you, the RN, can do that. So if that patient's not stable, the first time they're ambulating, you, the RN, need to walk with that patient so that you can assess them and make those requests to the healthcare provider as ordered or as needed. ADLs, bathing, dressing, feeding, absolutely the unlicensed assistive personnel can do it unless that patient is unstable. And let me give you an example. Same thing, patient just had a stroke. This is the first time that they're eating after the stroke. Guess what? You can't delegate that to a UAP. You, the RN, you have to keep that patient because while you're feeding that patient, you have to assess that patient and look how they swallow. If they look like they're choking or they're having a hard time uh, swallowing, you have to place a call to the healthcare provider and say, hey, you know, I was feeding the patient. I think he or she may have a hard time swallowing. Can we get a speech evaluation? Because with the speech evaluation, they do what? A swallow study, right? So it this and this is where critical thinking comes in, guys. It's not black and white. You have to look at the context of the entire situation before you make the decision of what's appropriate and what's not. Now, definitely under no circumstances would it be appropriate to delegate this to um, UAPs. They can't give medications. They can't suction patients and they cannot perform wound care. They can't do dressing changes. Select all that applies. Before delegating a task, you, the nurse, must consider what? Select all that applies. Before you can delegate delegate a task, what do you have to consider? Predictability of outcome, the potential for harm, the complexity of care, the speed of the task, the cost of the task, the race of the patient. So before you can delegate a, a task, what do you have to consider? Select all that applies. Okay, you have to you have to consider the predictability of outcome. Why? Well, the only types of patients, for example, that you can delegate to the LPN, right? The only type of patients you can delegate to them are going to be your most stable patient, the patient that um, you most likely can predict the outcome. So, for example, if you have a patient that is low acuity, they're only in there for, you know, hypertension. They've been on these medicate hypertensive medications for a while. You can give that to the LPN, right? Because their outcome is pretty much predictable. They give them the antihypertensive medication. We expect that blood pressure to drop. So predictability of outcome, absolutely, that must be considered. If the patient is in acute state that we don't know where they're going to go, we don't know what's going on with them, you can't delegate that to um, a PN. You have to keep that patient because they're unstable. The potential for harm, that absolutely must be considered. And um, not only the care, but the medication, right? So if you have a patient that they have to get a uh, caustic medication that if it infiltrates, it will basically cause necrosis to the surrounding tissues. You can't delegate that to a PN. You, the RN, you have to keep that patient because that medication is so harmful. Um, and so you have to do much, much closer um, assessments on that patient. You can't give it to the PN. Complexity of care. 
that also you have to be, uh, consider when you're delegating to the practical nurse, you want to give them the a patient that has the most routine going on, the most routine medication, the most routine um, wound care. You don't want to give them the type of patient where their care is very complex. You would have to keep that type of patient. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices, which you guys did such a great job with choosing the wrong answer choices, by the way. Good job of not choosing the wrong answers. I should say the speed of task. Nope. Let me tell you something. Testing world. We don't, unless it's an emergency situation, like we're running, we're rushing the patient to the OR, something like that. We don't care about time. In the real world, we care about time because time is money. But in the testing world, unless it's an emergent situation, we're not concerned about time. We're not concerned about finances. We're not concerned about staff. We're not concerned about resources, right? We're concerned, we're concerned about that stuff in real life. But for testing purposes, we have all the time in the world to do what we have to do for our patient, unless it's an emergent situation. We have the resources. We have the staff. We have the equipment. So we don't care about the speed of the task. We sure don't care about the cost of the task. And we really don't care about the race of the... Two people chose race, really? No, we don't care about the race of the patient. Which of the following tasks may be delegated to the unlicensed assistive personnel? Making changes to the care plan, teaching the patient about a new medication, Changing a soil dressing, making the patient's bed. Which one can you delegate to the unlicensed assistive personnel? All right, making the patient's bed. Remember, they're not licensed. They're not a nurse. You see this, making changes to the care plan? Even the practical nurse can't do that. Only the RN. The RN can create the care plan. The RN can um, make changes to the care plan. They can update the care plan. The PN follows the care plan. And remember, guys, please don't come at me in the comment section. I'm trying to help you. I'm not your enemy here. I'm not putting down PNs. I'm trying to help you pass your test. So for testing purposes, because we know the real world and testing world is completely different, okay? For testing purposes, only the RN can create and make changes to the care plan. The PN cannot. Teaching the patient about a new medication, only the RN can do that. Now the PN can come behind the RN after the RN has done that initial teaching and say, hey, you know, I know you learned about this medication, but you know, just to remind, just to remind you, after you take this antihypertensive, don't get up too quick. You might your blood pressure might drop. Make sure you dangle. Make sure you move position slowly. Changing a soil dressing. The RN can do that. The PN can do that. The unlicensed assistive personnel cannot. So out of all of these choices, making the bed, that is what you can delegate to them. A new admission from the PACU should be delegated to, and PACU guys is a post anesthesia um, care unit. So a new, a new admission from the PACU should be delegated to who? The RN, the PN, the UAP, or the medical secretary? You guys are awesome. That's right. The RN. Any new patient, and I don't care where they're coming from. I don't care if they're coming off from off the street, if they're coming from the OR, if they're coming from the ER, if they're coming from the PACU. If they are new to you, they're unstable until you've assessed them and deemed otherwise. So the RN, you, the RN, is going to keep that patient. Very good. Which of the following tasks should be delegated to the PN, the practical nurse? Creating a care plan? assessing a new injury, teaching on medication administration, or administering a routine medication? Which one can you delegate to the PN? Awesome, that's right. Administering a routine medication. This medication is routine. Patients got it before. We have an expected outcome, a predictable outcome. They can't create a care plan. 
assessing a new injury. No, the RN assesses that new injury. Then after the RN's done the initial assessment, then the PN, you know, if the PN is going to do wound care, whatever, of course the PN is going to be assessing that patient, but that initial um, assessment comes from who? The RN. Teaching on medication, nope, it's going to be who? The RN. Now the PN will come after the nurse and they can remind the uh, patient about the teaching, but that is the RN's responsibility. But giving a routine medication, yes, that can be delegated to the PN. All right, last question. Select all that applies. Which of the following are essential steps of the, of the admission process? Select all that applies. Orienting the patient to the staff, to the staff roles and the patient's room. Planning for discharge. Teaching the patient that advanced directives are required for admission. Documenting the patient's wishes about organ donation. Developing a rapport with the patient. Or Professor D, I have no clue. What are essential steps of the admission process? Okay, so orienting the patient to the staff, the staff roles, and the patient's room. Absolutely, that's part of the admission process. Planning for discharge. Ab Let me tell you something. The minute that your patient is admitted, that is the minute you start planning for discharge. Discharge planning starts at admission. Very good. Documenting the patient's wishes about organ uh, donation. Absolutely. You want to document that because you don't know what's going to happen during the stay. Developing a report for the patient. You absolutely want to develop a report because guess what? You're going to have more assessments coming up and you want that patient to be comfortable with you to ask questions and also express themselves if there are any concerns that the patient has. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choice. Teaching the patient that advanced directives are required for admission. No, they're not. They're encouraged, but they're not required for admission. And one person chose, I have no clue. Okay, you guys did a wonderful job. Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please, in the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover next and in what format. Do you want it in, you know, Q&A format, the one that I do on Sundays, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or do you want it in a Kahoot format? Do you want an lecture format? Let me know in the comment section. Also, don't forget, you can go to my website, Nexus Nursing Institute, to book your review today. Thank you for watching, and you guys will catch me on the next video.